Hello, everyone. I'm Latisse Lassier. I'm Director of Federal Policy at Resources Legacy Fund, and I'm a board member of Upstream. Thank you all for joining today's live stream, and thanks especially to our two guests, Miriam and Mustafa, for joining us uh, for this discussion. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Upstream, we are a nonprofit organization working to spark solutions to plastic pollution. In partnership with entrepreneurs, policymakers, community leaders, and other nonprofits, we seek to accelerate the transition from single use to reuse. In essence, we want to create a better way than throw away because we know people and the planet are indisposable. We also know that racial justice and environmentalism are inseparable. Though many of us have not appropriately or adequately considered them together in our lives and in our work. As a historically led environmental group, Upstream has been working through our own journey of racial equity and inclusion over the last 18 months. Then the unjust murders of George Floyd and many of other black lives led to an awakening in our country, pushing upstream and many others to evaluate ourselves and to commit to doing more and to doing better with urgency. And just yesterday, the outcome of the case against the police officers who killed Breonna Taylor was another reminder that the systems that run our country are failing. That's why we all need to get out of our own lanes. That's why we all need to be honest with ourselves and with each other about privilege, about power, and about the many troubling truths that are behind the curtain and in plain sight. As part of that process, we wanted to offer this live stream, though brief, as one of many discussions we all need to have. So let me welcome our guests, Miriam and Mustafa. Miriam Torres is an environmental justice advocate, urban planner, collaborative strategist, and mother of three. Woo. She is also my colleague at Resources Legacy Fund, where she develops, coordinates, and implements conservation and equity projects in California. Prior to RLF, Miriam was a coastal planner for the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission, where she developed and advanced environmental justice policies. Miriam was also the Southern California Program Director for the Environmental Justice Coalition for Water. She is a founding member of Water Education for Latino Leaders, and has held several other, other roles to ensure equitable access to parks and open spaces, clean water, and other community resources. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali is a renowned thought leader, international speaker, policymaker, community liaison, trainer, and facilitator. He's been a champion of social change and social justice since he was 16. Mustafa currently serves as the Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate, and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation. He is also the founder of Revitalization Strategies, a business focused on moving our most vulnerable communities from surviving to thriving. Previously, Mustafa was the Senior Vice President for the Hip Hop Caucus, he is a founding member of the EPA Office of Environmental Justice, and he has worked with more than 500 domestic and international communities to secure environmental, health, and economic justice. Thank you both again for being here. Okay, so it's clear that you've made your lives and your professional careers really focus on this intersection of environmentalism equity and justice. How did that work start for you and become part of who you are and what you do? Um, you know, and especially, what does that mean in this moment? Uh, Miriam, I'll turn it to you first to just give us a little more about how you got to where you are. And especially given that background you have about what's going on, you know, really relates to what's happening in this moment. Can you tell us more about how you got here in this 
Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Latisse, and um, thank you to everyone that's tuning in um, during these difficult times and, um, and allowing us to be part of your day. Um, the, the background um, I thought was very fitting for today, um, especially because of all of the racial injustice that's you know really surfacing, but really has been part of our history since day one. And, um, and because uh, Marvin Gaye uh, in his song, Mercy, Mercy Me, you may not be able to see the, the text, um, you know, touched on environmental justice issues. Um, I don't think that at the time or even, you know, uh, now when scholars look back to, to the movement, that they would, you know, necessarily uh, pick this as one of the, uh, one of those cultural, that cultural heritage uh, areas of work that, you know, we should really uh, uplift, right? Because uh, with over a million uh, records sold, you have to, you, 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 you have to provide that credit, right? That, that became part of the consciousness of the time and still is probably. Um, so for me, I actually didn't grow up in the States and I came to, you know, love oldies, um, in my teens, uh, once I immigrated to the States. Um, but um, for me, it really started as a kid in, in Mexico, li living in the mountains, um, climbing trees and, you know, drinking mm -hmm. uh, water from the rivers and, um, and then moving to uh, Koreatown in LA was really traumatizing and <laughs> difficult because then you can, go anywhere you were sort of confined to your apartment building uh, mm -hmm. or even just your apartment and um, those were you know really formative experiences for me um, and it, it just all came out in high school um, protesting LAUSD for wanting to put us in a high school that was built on contaminated land um, and you know just built built from there um, that personal connection and personal experience, both to the good and the bad. And Mustafa, your, your background also seems to tell your life story. Much of the biography I just mentioned seems to be captured on your wall, but how, how is it that you started in this movement at 16 and you've really made a career of this intersectionality between them? Yeah, you know, I, I came out of a family that was focused on, uh, you know, it was a faith-based family, but focused on civil rights and worker rights. My grandfather, my father, my mother, you know, all engaged in that space. And I grew up in two different places. I grew up in Appalachia and I grew up in Detroit, uh, right near Detroit. So two totally different worlds. But, you know, when I was growing up in Appalachia, we had no idea what folks were being exposed to. Right across the river was an old coal fire power plant. Mm -hmm. Um, and we got our water from a spring and we had no idea that there were heavy metals in it and we had no idea. My friends and I, we used to play ball outside and there used to be this thing we'd call the fog and it was actually the emissions from the plant across the river blowing across every now and then and we had no idea um, that it was making folks sick and then eventually we found out that, you know, my dad and my mom and my baby sister got cancer, my best friend, his mom got cancer. Oh. His aunt across the street, she got cancer. Our best friend, David, his dad got cancer. So, you know, um, folks had no idea what was going on. Uh, and then my family also, for my brothers and sisters and I, always said, we're not going to tell you what you have to do, but you have to give back. Um, and I was just blessed that civil rights leaders and the early environmental justice leaders saw something uh, in me, embraced me, um, and also taught me you know, the, the realness of what was going on. Um, and through that also said, you know, there's an expectation now for you and other young people at that time um, that you will move forward in a way that honors the work that had already happened long before I ever mm -hmm. started. Um, and, you know, taking those lessons and remembering those voices and people sometimes will ask you the question, well, how is it that you keep going? Well, one, you know, it's because of our ancestors. But two, also because of those elders and others 
you know, who you remember their faces, you remember their whispers, you remember their dedication to these issues. Um, and, and that keeps us going, many, many of us. Um, and, and that's a part of my journey. You know, I never take any credit for the work that I've done or the stuff, you know, that might be on the wall or those types of things. That's nice. As long as people are getting sick, as long as people are dying, then we mm -hmm. haven't been successful. Um, and, you know, and it always is about the community. Um, and communities speak for themselves. And as long as we anchor that um, as a part of, uh, or not even as a part, as the foundational element of the work that anyone does, uh, then we are at least starting to move in the right direction. And so I'm wondering for both of you, at what point does it become environmentalism? I grew up in Chicago with deep southern roots. My family was from Alabama, and basically what we learned was your environment is where you are. You know, you don't necessarily get to go to an island or a beach. You know, we don't have those resources. So it's your backyard. It's your neighborhood block. You know, it's the, so the red dirt um, in, in Mobile. Right. And so for the both of you, I'm curious, at what point did you embrace th the concept of environmentalism? What does it mean to be an environmentalist for, for both of you? Miriam? Um, I think for me, um, it, you know, it sort of synced in in college. Right. Um, it was presented as you know, the tragedy of the commons and the population bomb and silent spring, right? Learning about all these concepts, then you sort of start to understand that, okay, well, you know, we, we are, um, there's an urgency to protect the environment. And, um, and, and certainly it's different than the way that I experienced it because, um, when you come from a, a community that's underserved and and that is uh, disenfranchised, you don't understand that you do have power, uh, or 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 you're led to believe that you don't have power to to change the issues that are happening in your community. Um, and I think environmentalism, as you know, taught in school, so you know, sort of lay the foundation for understanding the uh, mechanisms by which you can empower yourself to make change. And we thought that environmentalism as a movement has changed, right? There are deep historical racist roots um, in environmentalism, but also the cultural norms have changed, societal norms have changed about what it means to be environmental, uh, you know, environmentalists, what it means to uh, use reusable products, you know, the choices you make, just those, those norms have changed over generations. And I want to hear more about, um, based on your background, you know, what are those changes that we're seeing and what are the implications of how the environmental movement has evolved over time? Well, the environmental movement, the climate movement is finally starting to begin to get some flavor, right? And they're getting flavor because they are now focusing on people, especially people of color are now a part of it. And we still got a huge amount of work to do to make sure that people are honoring that. Um, and, and it's also an understanding that, you know, the old conservation movement and conservation is important, but it was never for folks of color. It wasn't for women either. It was about white men protecting land so that they could hunt and so that they could take advantage of beautiful scenery. And, and you know, um, on its face, there's nothing wrong with protecting special places, right? Our indigenous brothers and sisters have been protecting it for millennia, so it's not like it is a new concept, but their concept was also, you know, not about doing damage while uh, honoring Mother Earth, which is the first principle of the environmental justice movement. Um, so, you know, there is now this, this evolution that is happening, but that evolution didn't just happen because it happened. It happened because people pushed and, and, and people created their own spaces because folks did not want folks of color in those conversations. So just real talk, right? The environmental movement did not want folks of color. The climate movement in its earliest days did not want folks of color as well. Um, and so folks created the environmental justice movement, right? Um, so that their voices, their ideas, 
the impacts that were happening in their communities could find a space that it was being um, strategized on, where their voices were honored. Um, and out of that, then, you know, these other movements began to say, hold up, wait a second, maybe we need to get down with a piece of what's going on here. And the reason being is, because we're going to have real talk today, is also <laughs> because the climate movement saw that in the beginning, it only wanted to focus on polar bears, they wanted to focus on the melting ice caps, you know, those types of things, which is important conversations, but they missed the fact. And folks were slow to the draw, along with all the deniers that still exist. And the fact that if you had paid attention to the disproportionate of impacts that were happening in black and brown communities and the placing of, you know, greenhouse gas emitting facilities and other toxins, those same thing that were making folks sick and causing them to lose their lives prematurely. Now that same pollution is what is warming up our oceans and our planet. And wait a minute, wait a minute. We need to get on this because how are we going to win this movement if we don't have the voices of black and brown folks? But the question is, it's not just about the voices and the pictures. It is about truly and being authentic partners and making sure that the power that also comes along with that, and I know Miriam is going to break it down for us here in a little bit, you know, that, you know, that not only people have a seat at the table, but they are also crafting out the narrative, that they are receiving the resources, because I'm real with folks, you know, we're talking about a billion dollar industry when we talk about, you know, the big green organizations and conservation organizations, so forth and so on. So we got to make sure the resources are actually going to the front lines. I hope that answers the question a little bit. It does. You know, it's interesting. One of our uh, Resources Legacy Fund works with a range of organizations. And one of the indigenous uh, communities we, we work with took us out on a tour uh, as a funder and said to me, we, we don't have the word restoration in our culture. Why is that? Because for millennia, we included Mother Earth as how we do things, right? We always sought to balance nature with our decisions, right? And so now we're at the point where um, not only do we need to include communities like that at the table, Mustafa, but they should be leading the conversation because it's deeply rooted, right? And so that's part of it. Um, the concerns about bringing people to the table after the decisions have been made for the photo op doesn't work, right? <laughs> Miriam, I'm going to have you chime in here on, on this part, really this power dynamic and power sharing, uh, resource sharing, uh, when it comes to uh, including communities of color, especially given the close cultural roots uh, of environmentalism in those, in those communities. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, it's very well documented that environmental justice organizations get, you know, a very, very small share of the funding that's out there um, to do the work. And, and, you know, and of course, by contrast, uh, white organizations are getting the lion's share of, of the funding. Um, and, you know, similarly, the um, you know, there, there's definitely more recognition that um, people of color need to be integrated into these organizations and there have been lots of, you know, efforts to have um, staff members as part of, you know, part of the the um, brown and brown, brown folks um, as part of the staff in these organizations and um, I think, you know, I think all of that is changing, but we, we still have a long way to go. The boards of all of these various organizations are still, you know, largely led by white folks and, and men. Um, and, um, and, you know, people of color organization and organizations that are representing communities of color, they, you know, they're doing what they can with what they have, um, but they're, they're super stretched thin. And I think that's something that's not recognized is um, the the fact that is in these communities it can, it cannot be just about air quality or you know uh, the 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 issues of um, parks or you know the sea level rise. It's it's about that and 
putting bread on the table and having access to health insurance and you know mm-hmm. being able to get a job um so if you can't if these organizations can't speak to that and can't support their communities on that nobody's going to listen to them they're not going to show up mm-hmm. to some protests at the water board if you know if you can't provide support with those basic needs because at the end of the day you know that's that's what matters most right um you have to be able to feed your children you have to be able to to sleep at night because you'll be able to pay your rent right and if you can't do that then then that's a problem um a lot of the organizations that you know we work with that are base that are base building that are in, you know in the community they are now during covid they've had to shift to providing those basic services supporting kids mm-hmm. with laptops what does that have to do with environmental justice uh well if those kids don't learn let me tell you they're not going to become ej uh or, or you know simply environmental um uh, you know, they're not going to be at your agencies taking the jobs of the folks that are, you know, retiring. Um, they won't become environmental champions without the opportunity to do so, right? And so we have to acknowledge that the opportunities need to be provided. So that's where that intersectionality comes in, right? Um, right, absolutely. So I was just about to say that's internet, the intersectionality, right? Forget intersectional, intersectional environmentalism, but that's intersectionality and acknowledging that uh, many of these dynamics have been baked in for decades, right? Dec- centuries um, when it comes to housing, economic opportunity, clean air, clean water, um, access to health care, all those things that you mentioned. And so what I want to pose to the both of you, starting with you, Mustafa, is so how do we get past some initial barriers? You have traditional environmental groups who are now awakening to racial injustice, environmental injustice, and none of this is new, right? Much of it has been ignored for a long time, but it's not new. So given the the audience, the breadth of the audience we have today, how do those traditional environmental groups get beyond that initial barrier of trying to build genuine partnerships and communities, uh, provide, you know, make sure they're sharing power and wealth and resources when those communities have so many things to juggle. If Upstream comes into a community and says, we want to solve plastic pollution and they don't have basic health care, right? How do you get what are some thoughts on the best ways for a genuine a partnership to happen and get beyond some of those initial barriers? Well, let's start where you, um, let's take a step back a little bit, right? Because folks want to rush to creating authentic, genuine partnerships with communities without fixing themselves first, right? Mm-hmm. So Miriam gave you a part of the formula, right? So what's your board look like? Um, And and does it look like the communities that you say you want to engage with? And if it doesn't, you got work to do. What does your senior leadership look like, right? And Mm -hmm. that gets real tough for folks. You started to talk a little bit about the money right now. So, you know, here's reality of the situation. And and folks can correct me if I'm wrong, because maybe something happened last night that I don't know about. Uh, Last time I looked, there was not an African-American man or woman or a Latinx man or woman Uh, who are running a major um, environmental organization. So if you want to be able to be truly authentic in your partnership, then when folks look at your organization, when they look at your board, when they look at your middle management, they should see themselves reflected in what's going on. What happens when you actually have that? Then you got folks who start to push on the infrastructure and the strategy and saying, We've got to have this now in our priority setting, in our strategic plan. And then that way mm-hmm. you can also make sure that resources are going to communities. Because it's great for you to show up at a community talking about, I want to be a partner. And you have a $100 million budget or a $50 million budget, and they got a $50,000 a year budget. There is a power dynamic that's going there. And what are you planning on doing to help them to build capacity? So, you know, you got to be really careful that you, uh, you're not pimping people. Um, you know, what you got going on. Maybe I better say that again, too. Don't pimp people, to me, um, you know, for those. So y'all can hashtag that and go ahead and work it out and see how you want to utilize it. 
that's that's a part of the process, right? But that's the mm -hmm. internal stuff we can do. The other part of it is that we have structural inequality, right? Our policies, our policies on the federal and the state and the county and the local level and inside of our organizations have to be aware of the fact that there is systemic racism, biases, and discrimination that play out in that. And there has to be an analysis, mm -hmm. true analysis of that to make change happen. I know I don't want to take too much time on this, but you asked me to go ahead and break this down for folks. Um, so those are just a couple of things and I'll be quiet so we can move forward. No, that's great. And you're right. We can't just come into communities and have asks and demands, right? Uh, we have to come in with resources and support and capacity and also just get out of the way, right? Miriam, how can organizations with these $50 million, $1 million, $100 million budgets who think they've gotten it all right. We're not the racists. We're not the ones causing this power dynamic. We aren't the ones making mistakes. Like how can these organizations uh, get out of their own way, really think about how they can change, be willing to acknowledge the mistakes they are making, um, what are some of the questions, I guess I should say it that way, what are some of the questions that some of these organizations and their leaders can ask themselves? Because you can't just hire a new black person, send them to the brown community to represent your organization and check a box, right? So what, what are some of the questions that the organizations can ask themselves and their leaders? Yeah, so, I, and, you know, before answering, I do want to just, re, you know, reflect on the fact that, you um, EJ organizations will tell you time and time again, we are tired of you coming to us and saying, you know, sign up mm -hmm. to our letter of support, uh, work on our issue and, and not reciprocate, right? So I think that's the first thing. How are you going to authentically show up, authentically reciprocate? And, uh, and, and part of that is funding, sure. You know, a, a big part of that is funding because, because it's, you know, it's, it's definitely super uneven. Um, but some of it is also just, you know, coming to, coming to um, understand the work of the organization and, and really, you know, take, taking a look at where can I be supportive? Where can I share my power, right? Every, um, every environmental organization, especially the large ones, they have a huge network. They are connected to so many politicians. They're connected to decision makers. Um, often enough, those those folks can be called upon to to move another issue, to move an issue along that an EJ community has been struggling with, and um, and so really understanding the the ways in which you can provide support um, both. Mon in monetary terms, but in, in, you know, networking in other sorts of ways that where you can bring your expertise. Um, but, you know, take, taking it slow also, not expecting that you're mm -hmm. going to come in and then right away people are going to trust you and want to work with you because that, that's just unrealistic. Yeah, it's not enough to just dump money, right? To, like you said, the network, to provide technical assistance. Many of these organizations are small and they are focused on, on other missions. So just giving more money and saying, okay, so, so you go do this environmental project is not enough, right? It's still the additional support and access to the power um, and to the assistance and all those things that are, that are critical. Um, so on that, I'm, I'm curious um, from both of your perspectives, either in your current roles and your current organizations or in your past roles, are there some lessons learned that you can highlight um, where growth happened? Or are there some, pray, you know, some kudos, some, some things you've seen go well that should and could be replicated um, when talking about this issue of inequities and in the environmental movement. So just you know, things that, let's not do that again, people. Here's one example, <laughs> no need to call names. And here's some examples of things that seem to go well and really should be promoted you know, um, as ways to address these issues. Yeah, I mean, there are a number. Um, you know, one is don't belittle people and, and don't deny them their truth, 
right? Their truth is their truth. You um, may come drive by a community. You might even spend an hour in a community, but you have no idea mm -hmm. about what's going on. Mrs. Ramirez and Mr. Johnson are the experts about what goes on in their communities, and they should be honored uh, and respected um, just as much as, as anybody else who you might find value in and engage with. You know, when I was first working at uh, the EPA and when I was a student, I remember walking down the hallway to the first environmental equity meeting at that time. And there were two uh, older white gentlemen who were walking in front of me. And I remember them saying, I have no idea why we're going to this meeting because the folks that these, what these folks have been sharing can't be true and they're probably lying. And these were folks who were supposed to have a responsibility for the protection of folks across our country. So, you know, you got to deal with that kind of foolishness. But then you also got to look at organizations and say, all right, so is this just window dressing what you're doing? Because we're in a certain moment. So, you know, you throw some black and brown folks on, on a pamphlet um, or you invite somebody to a meeting or are you structurally making change happen? So I'll use NWF as an example. You know, NWF has a full environmental justice analysis that is now happening at that organization. You got six million members, right? 300 plus people are working for it. So that means that every one of the policies, uh, actions, budgeting decisions, and, and other types of policies has to go through an EJ analysis um, to make sure that you're not doing harm and that you're doing good, if you will. Um, and, and that's just one example. But here's the other example that's critically important also, Miriam and others you know, are experts in this space, is that you also got to highlight when community-led projects are causing, you know, positive change and action to happen. You know, there are a number of examples of black and brown-led projects that get no attention, even though they're some of the most successful projects that have ever happened in the environmental or climate context in the history of our country. One of them is the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It took a $20,000 grant leveraged in almost $300 million in changes, right? So if it was another organization that was leading that, you would have it written in every one of, uh, you know, even Republicans would probably be writing it down in their history books, uh, talking about how good it is. Oh, and Democrats, so I make sure that we're not partisan in our conversation today. I'm sure both sides would do that. Um, but that's just one example. You know, when you have these incredible sets of actions that are happening and people who have expertise and partnership development, those are the folks that we should be looking to. Those are the folks we should be funding and asking the question, well, how do we do that more? If I worked at a Fortune 500 company, I just talked to some people last night, and I said, if you make a $20,000 investment and it's going to turn to $300 million, next thing you know, you'd be actually running the company because you were able to leverage resources like that. When we have black and brown communities who are able to do that. We should be highlighting them and supporting them and people should be literally throwing money at them saying, do more, do more, do more, help save this planet uh, and help save our country. Yes. <laughs> Miriam, would you like to speak to that just a little bit more about maybe some examples of things you've seen go well or examples of things we should um, try to counter? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, from, um, the, the community perspective, as Mustafa was uh, acknowledging, that there, there, there are so many uh, grassroots organizations, right, that are taking on giant issues and you know chipping away, chipping away at it, uh, even when you know people will tell tell them to 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 step back. It's not it's not something that they need to be involved in and I saw that happen I was part of that process in drinking water uh, many communities still have unsafe access to drinking water in California uh, but many more did back you know back when uh, a, you know a small number of uh, organizations started in the Central Valley um, community water center the fantastic women there were you know uh, trying to raise the profile of this issue, uh, legislators would sort of like, you know, just keep keep going, keep walking, keep doing their thing. Um, and, you know, 
um, bill after bill sort of declaring, you know, the, the importance of safe drinking water, the, you know, water as a human right. It just, it took so many years and, you know, finally uh, funding has been allocated to address the issues to act, you know, to, to leading to it, communities actually having access to safe drinking water, very small communities, farm worker communities, communities that are otherwise disconnected from, um, you know, the cities that have been enjoying uh, safe drinking water all along. And, um, and I, you know, and I think that, that those stories have definitely um, had more, you know, more, more attention in the media recently uh, because of the work of these organizations. Um, but there's a great need throughout the country. And, you know, if they could be, if, if they could be even more, um, uh, yeah, if they could even see more um, connection to other areas, that would be great. So I know we, we're going to have to shift pretty soon to opening up the questions to the Q&A to the audience, but I do want to give you a chance to highlight a, a couple of tips and resources. Uh, we will share resources and this recording after, but if you want to highlight just now a couple of resources on sort of step-by-step -step or actions or um, how to learn more um, for organizations that might be listening uh, today. Uh, Mustafa? Well, um, as I always say, you know, uh, make sure that you are connecting with frontline organizations, the environmental justice networks that are out there. there. There's something, no matter what your flavor is or how you want to get at the issue, there is somebody who will meet that need. And, and if you're coming as an authentic ally, um, then, you know, you'll be welcome, but you need to spend some time listening first and then figuring out what it is that you actually have to offer in that space. Uh, the other thing that I'll raise is that Let's make sure that we're also supporting and honoring all these incredible young leaders who are also doing it and doing it well and leaving lots of the isms of the past where they need to be in the past. Um, so that's super important. And luckily in the environmental justice movement, we have an intergenerational movement where we honor the wisdom of our elders and embrace that ingenuity and innovation that young people have. And then I'll leave this last point also We've got to have our creatives. You've got to support the creatives. That has been one of those missing components of the movements uh, in making sure. Miriam, you know, she dropped knowledge on you and she had the backdrop for you. Um, but, you know, there are so many incredible folks who will be able to reach folks uh, to get those barriers dropped down so that you can have honest conversations on a human level. Wouldn't it have been nice if they had embraced humanity when they shot Breonna Taylor? I'm not gonna go too much into that, but we see that dehumanization happening in so many communities across our country. So we gotta make sure that we're doing that. You can always go to MustafaSantiagoAli.com and I can get you hooked up with whomever and I can also point you in the direction of resources. Yeah, as a scientist, I, we, we always struggle with this sort of bringing in the social sciences as well. And so in a movement like this, we need the poets, we need the artists, we need the singers, right? We need the community because they just thread it together, right? Um, to, to bring attention to these, to these issues. Uh, so Miriam, any specific resources and, and tips you wanna highlight before we open up for more questions? Get uncomfortable. You know, listen to Assis Ansari, um, Chappelle, uh, John Leguizano. The artists, you know, they 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 know how to they know how to break it down and make you laugh. <laughs> so um, I think you know, get uncomfortable but act, and I think that's the the key piece, right? Like figure out where you can share your power you you know every person that's listening here has some power to share what is that maybe you can volunteer uh you know at your local school if you're a parent and you know figure out how to address racial injustice in the learning environment um maybe you can you know join a, a text a club to get out the vote um there are so many different ways, right? I think it's really just, it doesn't have to be uh, linked, 
you know, primarily to the environment, uh, I think, in terms of the, the journey of understanding racial inequities, um, it, it takes time. And so be, you know, be patient with yourself. Could I just add one thing real quick as we go yeah. to the questions? Mm -hmm. Miriam hit it. I just want to reinforce it. You have got to get engaged in the civic process on the local level, in the county, in the state, and the federal, because we can have the greatest ideas in the world. And if we don't have those folks in elected office who are using our tax dollars doing the right thing, then it's going to make it super difficult for us to achieve, you know, all of these goals that we know are doable. So you got to vote. I would say that, the, you know, though the focus of this webinar has been on racial justice, there, there is intersectionality and inequality across various issues, right? And we do need to acknowledge our privilege and our power across that. Miriam touched on that a little bit earlier about white male boards. You know, there's some, you know, inequity when it comes to women and what they can bring. There is inequity about able body versus not, and there's such, such a range. And too often, Mustafa, you mentioned youth, youth are discounted, right? And the power that they bring um, can be discounted. Uh, sometimes we don't turn to our elders to get what they know, right? We, we young people have to touch the, the fire to know it burns when grandma said, I told you, right? So we need to really think about intersectionality when it comes to um, this issue of environmentalism and inequity and injustice. Uh, along so many different lines. So I'm going to start to get questions coming in from the audience. I'm going to uh, pose one of them to you now. Uh, how can the environmental industry attract more young people to, ma to major in environmental studies and seek jobs in the environmental sector? So I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. So, uh, Miriam, I think to some degree it goes to what you were saying before, just making sure they have the laptops and the resources. How do they ultimately come to the agency or have a seat at the table at the organization if they didn't get the, the tools and resources and the education um, that they, they needed? So, how do we encourage um, young people to make environmental studies even a part of their, um, their trajectory? Um, well, I, th I think that there is, you know, a lot of a lot to unpack here, unfortunately, and I don't I don't know that we can get into the whole the whole thing here, but um, Certainly pipeline programs are needed um, by pipeline programs that, you know, start even at the K through 12 level. Um, having that education be part of the, you know, K through 12 system is important and um, but but having it in a, you know, culturally relevant way. Um, I, I don't, I can't stress this enough, you know, the, 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 the student body of today is, is so different than before. And it's going to be so, even so much more different in, you know, in some years. And all those kids have, you know, different ways of learning and coming and, and, and to be able to uh, connect with the environment, um, information needs to be presented in ways that resonate with them. Uh, the arts, I think, is, is a good area. Um, but then also, you know, have, have providing funding to ensure that urban uh, children can access these beautiful outdoor spaces that are right now are predominantly visited by white folks um, that they can visit them in families right we we underestimate the importance of having children and their families be able to enjoy together you know a day at the beach a day at you know uh any national park and so um i think it's it's not only about the education it's about the you know the whole experience the whole you know experience of these communities uh, mustafa i'm going to combine a couple questions here i'm seeing in the thread in essence multiple people are asking do you have advice on what they should do if they're within an organization 
uh, especially a larger organization, but even small ones, if they're within an organization where the management or the leaders just don't get it. They don't want to get involved in Black Lives Matter. They don't want to jump on the bandwagon of environmental equity. Um, they don't plan to do much more. And it seems multiple people are saying they're trying to get their voices heard. They're trying to raise these issues and they're hitting barriers at certain organizations, getting authentic change and, and an authentic plan forward. Any advice? Well, yeah, you're going to continue to, you know, try and um, bring information and, and work with folks. But the reality of the situation is you might want to get your resume together too. And here's the reason why. You may like where you're at, but the reality is if you have an antiquated organization, they're going to have a difficult time in raising revenue and resources moving forward because people are paying much more attention. Uh, to uh, what a organization stands for. And it may not be in the next six months, but there will be other organizations that will properly fill the space um, that will become much more uh, attractive uh, to those who are utilizing and spending their dollars. They'll be more attractive if we're talking about the nonprofit sector, because I already see it happening uh, in, in the shifting portfolios uh, of where folks are going to invest. Um, and, and you'll just, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself uh, running into so many problems if you're not willing to evolve, right? Um, so, you know, that is a part of, you know, what needs to happen. You know, there are other things that, that you can continue to do, you know, an engagement if it's a place that has a board, um, and if there are opportunities for comment there. Um, but, you know, the reality of the situation is you're always going to have those folks who are antiquated, uh, who are resistant to change. Uh, and you very rarely see those organizations uh, surviving uh, the cultural shift that is happening in our country. The reality is there is a cultural shift, right? And it is, it, part of it is the browning of America, but it is also a cultural shift where young people are coming together of all hues and saying that 21st century America is gonna look different um, because we're gonna play a strong role uh, in making sure that it lives up uh, to the ideals that it said it's supposed to be about. Um, so all of that for me plays into wherever you might be in this particular moment. And it does seem that some of them are trying to say, you know, give suggestions on board makeup, give suggestions on staff, give suggestions on strategic plans. So I think it's a good point that at some point it's about the values of that organization and the values of the leadership. Um, and I'm just gonna stay on this a little longer with you, Mustafa, before I switch back to Miriam. It's one audience member wants to know more details about what uh, NWF is doing, specifically on their EJ analysis and how they are shifting over time to a more equitable organization. So what, are, what are you seeing there that people can learn from? So there's a whole bunch of different things that are going on there, and I won't take up too much time. But, you know, part of the environmental justice analysis is actually you know, when you are talking about working on legislation, making sure that the voice of communities is playing an active role uh, in, that, in that development, right? NWF has some privilege because it can go to the Hill um, and, you know, they, they get the sit downs and, and people call them, so forth and so on. So making sure that the other organizations that are actually on the front lines are a part of those sets of conversations. When you look at your budget, you begin to also have to have some tough conversations about you know, we've got to make sure that a significant percentage of our dollars is actually going to the work that is happening on the front lines. Um, and, and what does that look like in bringing folks in? NWF is also going to have an environmental justice advisory committee made up of frontline leaders and others uh, who will be engaging with the board, who engage with the president, um, and, and also are helping to make sure there's real accountability in this process that we're doing. Um, and, and activities. So our activity is actually beneficial to the folks who need us the most to be standing in authentic partnership with them. So those are just a few of the examples. The other one is using, uh, you know, your resources also to make sure that you are supporting things that folks need. We have the first presidential forum for environmental justice ever. Let me say that again, the first presidential forum for environmental justice ever. We were a part of it with other partners. Um, and helping to frame that out and to make sure that that happened. And recently, we just had a, a set of environmental justice roundtables around the country focusing on Black and Brown and Indigenous folks talking about what was happening in their communities, but also policy recommendations about what we needed to do. That report was put together 
moved to a national town hall. Again, one of the first times we ever had something where over a couple thousand people were a part of it. And then there's a report that goes to Capitol Hill, that goes to a new administration, um, and that goes to state houses. So for folks can utilize that along with the other information that frontline communities have already invested and created, which is important also because it is a partnership. And all of that came from 14 local partners and eight national partners. And there was a reason why there was 14 local partners because Miriam talked to us about it and I talk about it sometimes as well, power dynamics, making sure that you, know, you have more folks from the communities uh, who are playing into this, the, the overall analysis and creation um, than you do others. So those are just a few of the things. Um, hit me up, I can walk you through more because we need more organizations. And I'll say this last, if a place like NWF, which is not known as a liberal organization by any stretch of the imagination, can start to make these moves happen, why can't others? And I'll let y'all define who others are. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we can curate maybe some of this for the resources we send out. Of course, we'll at least share your emails if people have more specific questions, but maybe there's something re regarding the NWF work that we can just curate and put in the follow-up email. Um, and Miriam, I did want you to speak to this, but we have so many questions coming in. I'm going to pull a couple questions together for you to address. Uh, many people are still asking, you know, just for more tips on how to authentically build a relationship. It takes time, right? How do you introduce yourself to a community, really get a sense of what's uh, a priority there and build this relationship over time? How do you do that authentically for uh, certain organizations uh, that uh, might have a certain, uh, uh, they might be a large organization with a board and lots of hierarchy, right? And then there are also small organizations that would like to do that, and they don't necessarily have the capacity. So perhaps tips on just the best way to build those relationships with an asterisk, uh, with COVID especially, how can you do that virtually, right? It's harder to meet face-to-face -face these days. So a combination of dynamics happening, how can they start now to build those relationships? Oof. That's hard. <laughs> During COVID, I mean, it everything is just different. And I, I don't know that I could do it, you know, the way that it always has been. Um, I, I don't think that the same, you know, the same ways apply. And um, we, we th this moment will change. So I, uh, I'm not gonna try and make some, something up for that right now. I think, you know, I think the same that you would, you know, interact with a new neighbor in your neighborhood right if if you have someone that moves in next to you how do you interact with them do you you know come across the way and say hello or do you tell them don't park in my spot <laughs> um i think you know i think you it, it's it's similar right you um extend an invitation to have a conversation um and you start to share resources you know, or, or start to talk about how you can share resources right away so that, you know, so that it's understood that you're not just coming for your own benefit, but that you have something to offer as well. Um, and listen, I mean, I think that this is a very, uh, un, you know, I can't, I can't stress this enough. People don't know how to listen. <laughs> they don't know how to listen to, to brown folks. Especially, um, and you know, understanding different ways of communicating—it's important as well. The way that you that you communicate with, you know, uh, your colleagues that you've always worked with is is you know not going to necessarily be the same way that you should communicate with, you know, some young folks in um, in, in in a low-income community of color. Is you know, it's just different. And, um, and so, you know, I think if you have allies that you can turn to, if you have people that have, uh, that can serve as a bridge, if you have, uh, you know, a friend <laughs> that can help you sort of understand those different ways of communicating, uh, you know, there's certainly classes out there. Um, there's a, a whole cottage industry around, um, 
uh, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? A lot of it is sort of framed around the work environment. Um, so bringing, bringing those folks in, those lessons could potentially apply to how you work with other organizations. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think those are some of the thoughts I have on that. I don't know, Mustafa, if you wanna to add to that. Uh, Sister Torres, I think you hit it. I mean, my formula is really simple. I think about it the same way. If you want to have a healthy marriage, right, or if you want to have a healthy boyfriend, girlfriend, or partner, partner relationship, I mean, the first part is, you know, you got to build trust, and trust comes with time, right? The other part of it is communication, and is, as was said, is active, right? Active listening. Um, that's a part of that. And then the third part is value. Do you value your partner, right? Um, and if you truly do, then that means and respect. In respect, you're not going to do certain things, right? Because you don't want to lose that respect. Um, so it's you know it's not that difficult, but for some reason, people get it twisted all the time, and they want to. Well, I'll do number one and two, but I'm not doing number three. Well, it, it just healthy relationships don't work like that. Whether they're personal relationships, or if you're trying to build relationships, you know, uh, with a community organization or some other entity. The basics will get you there. Mi abuela, she used to tell me all the time, you know, do you listen? And of course, um, I had to learn to effectively do that. Luckily, I was raised in a very matriarchal uh, family and movement, um, so it is ingrained in me. But a lot of folks, you know, they, they can't leave their privilege, right? They can't leave the degrees after their name. Um, and, and they don't really listen. They'll nod their heads, but they're not actively listening. Um, but when you find people who are, that's when you see real change happen. <laughs> you, you talk about your grandmother, it makes me think mindset. You heard, and it's not just, you know, did you take that in? Did you process, <laughs> right? You heard me? Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 mama. <laughs> I heard you. Um, well, there, there are only a couple minutes left, and there's still so many questions. Um, one of the things I, I, I will try to capture here, seeing people wonder how do they shift their mission, how do they adjust their programs to answer to the issues of the day, and COVID just complicates it all, right? And my own advice, I've said to many organizations, be true to your mission. You don't have to change what you are, who you are. You have to acknowledge the gaps you need to fill, the mistakes you're making, right? And then how can you then use those tools, your mission, staying true to your mission to um, bring in these other elements, right? Um, and so it's not about just becoming a completely different organization and focusing on something else altogether. So I'll say that briefly based on some of the questions I'm seeing. Um, with a minute left, I'm going to turn it for flash, final words, Miriam, to the audience on, on this issue. I would just say, do it with love. Thank you. Mustafa. I would say you have power unless you give it away. So utilize your power to make real positive change happen. Uh, and, and utilize your power in a way that benefits others. Well, I want to thank you both for taking time again to have this discussion, this honest discussion. It's one of many that we all should be having. Right. Um, we only spent an hour here, but I know these conversations are happening all around the country and within many organizations and frankly within many households and among family members right right now. Uh, this has been recorded. We will share the recording um, after uh, through the email list and through upstream social media channels. Um, you will also receive a short survey after you leave this session for everyone in the audience uh, so that you can let us know what you think. Uh, and please be sure to visit Upstream's website at upstreamsolutions.org and sign up for our newsletter, listen to the podcast. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the things, all the things. So thank you all again. And uh, that's the end of our live stream. Thanks, everybody.